Douglas P. Horn, our next speaker, served as head of the military records team on the Assassination Records Review Board, the independent federal agency established by Congress in the 1990s to secure release of the long secret official records relating to the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. The ARRB, of course, was, was formed in response to the public outcry over the secrecy of records as reflected in, in, in John in uh, Oliver Stone's movie, JFK. Horn played an instrumental role in locating and securing the release of US military records on Cuba and Vietnam policy from 1961 through 1964. He is the author of the five volume book, which is absolutely fantastic and which really was an eye opener for me, uh, called the U uh, Inside the Assassination Records Review Board, the US government's final attempt to reconcile the conflicting medical evidence in the assassination of JFK. And the author of FFF's best selling ebook, JFK's War with the National Security Establishment, Why Kennedy Was Assassinated. He also made a six and a half hour video presentation entitled Altered History, Exposing Deceit and Deception in the JFK Assassination Evidence for the Future of Freedom Foundation, which has now received 240,000 views. His most recent view, uh, book, Deception, Intrigue, and the Road to War, is about FDR and Pearl Harbor. The title of Doug's book is The National Security Establishment's Obsession with Invading Castro's Cuba, 1960 to 63, The Bay of Pigs, Northwoods, and Beyond. Please welcome my friend, Douglas Horn. Okay, can everybody hear me? Good. It's a great honor to be part of this conference. Thank you, Jacob. And thank you to the Future Freedom Foundation. Now, my presentation is very heavy on text, as my presentations always are. So, uh, because of time limitations today, I'm sure I will not be able to cover each point on each slide in the detail that I might normally like. So, uh, when you notice me summarizing something rather briefly, or perhaps moving to another slide, or skipping one or two items, uh, please keep in mind that this will be online. This, this presentation will be online in four or five weeks probably, perhaps even sooner. And there will be this visual record of the PowerPoint so you'll be able to go back and read all of this uh, text in detail. Thank you. This slide is an overview of what you're gonna hear today in this uh, presentation. From August of 60 until December of 63, the national security establishment was obsessed with invading Cuba and left a considerable paper trail documenting this. Now by November and December of 1960, the CIA knew that its exile invasion, which later took place at the Bay of Pigs, could not succeed without overt US military intervention but nevertheless continued planning for it on the assumption that overt U.S. military intervention would be provided when it began to fail. JFK had warned openly that he would not allow U.S. military forces to participate in a Cuban invasion, but the CIA and the Pentagon did not believe him and were mistakenly convinced he could be leveraged if and when the invasion began to falter. And of course the invasion faltered and failed. It was the perfect failure. We'll talk about this in a minute. Now, Operation Mongoose was established on November 30th of 1961, and its goal was to sponsor psychological and economic pressure, sabotage, and military, paramilitary operations against Cuba, and the goal was to bring down the Castro regime. Uh, everybody in this room probably knows that. But some of you may not know is that stimulated by the mongoose operations officer, uh, Brigadier General Lansdale of the Air Force, in March 1962, the Pentagon proposed numerous pretexts for instigating a US military invasion of Cuba, dubbed Operation Northwoods. And this plan stimulated by Lansdale and submitted by Lemnitzer, uh, 
was rejected by JFK that same month. So in April of 1962, the very next month, the Joint Chiefs of Staff wrote a blistering tutorial to Secretary of Defense McNamara demanding that the United States invade Cuba and no longer mentioning pretexts. They said, we have to do this anyway and we have to do it right now. Well, that did not happen. Now, as you all know, during the missile crisis in, the, in October of 62, JFK prepared for and considered possible airstrikes and a massive invasion, but eventually resolved the crisis through diplomacy, infuriating the military intelligence establishment. An informal no invasion pledge was publicly made by the Kennedy administration in November of 1962 in exchange for no, no reintroduction of offensive weapons into Cuba by the USSR. And what surprised me as I was writing my uh, volume five of my book, Inside the ARRB, was that throughout 1963, the Pentagon continued to study the use of pretexts as an excuse to invade Cuba and actually planned an invasion for 1964. Uh, and the person behind that was Kennedy's most trusted general, General Maxwell Taylor, which is still very disturbing to me. At the same time, Taylor is uh, engaged in this activity in the Pentagon. The US government is trying to hammer out a formal new policy on Cuba. And uh, basically, the State Department does not favor unilateral military intervention, and the Pentagon does. And in the long run, when they come up with a new policy at the end of October 63, the State Department has lost the battle. We'll talk about that in more detail. Now, remarkably, all of the above pressure to overthrow the Castro government by unilateral U.S. military action took place in an environment where the U.S. Commander-in-Chief, President Kennedy, strongly opposed any U.S. invasion of Cuba with the U.S. military. It is a remarkable example of a national security establishment determined to see its will prevail over a non-cooperative chief executive. Only with JFK's assassination in 1963 and Lyndon Johnson's immediate focus on Vietnam instead of Cuba, did this pressure to invade Cuba subside and wither away. So this is our topic today. There are implications of this struggle, which, I'll, which I hope to reach at the end of the presentation, if I don't run out of time. So the Bay of Pigs, what became the Bay of Pigs was born in March of 1960 when Eisenhower approved covert actions against the Castro regime. There was no mention yet of U.S. military invasion, at least not overtly, but paramilitary operations were envisaged. So the actual uh, permission, excuse me, the actual, yeah, permission to conduct paramilitary ops and invade Cuba with Cuban exiles uh, was issued on, in August of 1960 by President Eisenhower. His main concern was plausible deniability. So the initial plans only uh, envisaged using about 500 uh, Cuban exiles. And, that, and the key thing about this plan was that it had to stimulate an internal uprising. That was absolutely essential to its success. This was the planning, the thinking in August of 1960. Just to keep yourself apprised of what else is going on. In August of 1960, the same month, the CIA began to enlist the American Mafia to assassinate Castro. Now this is important, and this comes from John Newman's new book, Countdown to Darkness, number two in his three book series about the assassination. I highly recommend it. On November 3rd of 1960, in a National Security Council meeting, the Pentagon, the State Department, and the National Security Advisor had all already dismissed the internal uprising myth. They knew it was not going to happen. Castro's police force was too large, his army was too large, and his control of the populace was 
was well established and he was popular. Here's the quote from John Newman's book. Uh, this is from the minutes of that NSC meeting. Quote, Mr. Gray, that's Eisenhower's NSA, expressed the opinion that we will never be able to clean up the situation without the use of overt US military force. He suggested the possibility of using the CIA backed exiles to mount a simulated attack on Guantanamo in order to offer an excuse for overt intervention, end quote. So this is the first mention of the possible use of pretexts to invade Cuba. Now, although this didn't happen at that time, this idea remained alive within the US government and uh, actually dominated planning in 1962 and three, the use of pretexts. Here's another quote from John Newman's book. On November 15th, 1960, in a, in a CIA uh, Western Hemisphere 4 meeting, uh, this quote is from a report they issued from the meeting. And that report of their meeting quotes another document, which we don't have yet in full. But this is the quote they put in their own report from this meeting. Our original concept is now seen to be unachievable in the face of the controls Castro has instituted. There will not be the internal unrest earlier believed possible, nor will the defenses permit the type of strike first plan. Our second concept of 1,500 to 3,000 men uh, securing a beach with an airstrip is also now seen to be unachievable, except as a joint agency DOD action. So nobody in the US government who knows anything at this time believes that the Bay of Pigs, or at the time it was called Pluto, would succeed on its own, that the exiles would succeed. Nobody believes that. And as John Newman states, this is a Rosetta Stone to understanding what happened in the coming months. JFK was repeatedly falsely informed by the CIA that the exile invasion would indeed stimulate a widespread internal uprising in Cuba that would lead to Castro's downfall. And they knew it wasn't true. And the reason they lied to the president is because if they told him that they knew the whole operation would be canceled. He did not favor any US invasion of Cuba. So President Kennedy was briefed uh, twice right after the election by Dulles and Bissell. The first time, I think it was November the 18th. We don't have a documentary record of what was said, but we do have a record of what was said on November 29th. And uh, here's what happened. Uh, Bissell told the president that uh, a significant strike force, that's the Cuban exiles, would act as a catalyst in ultimately provoking an anti-Castro uprising on the island. This lie is repeated and maintained ever after by the CIA in all subsequent presidential planning sessions for the exile invasion. On January 3rd, 1960, President Eisenhower raises the subject of pretexts, which his national security advisor had raised the previous year. And Eisenhower said, quote, perhaps we could think of manufacturing something that would be generally acceptable. And you know, he said if, end quote, and if, we had a, if he had a really good excuse, he'd send in US troops then, but he, he didn't have a really good excuse. So that idea is, remains alive within the US government and uh, basically takes over US planning in 62 and 63, the use of pretexts. On January 11th, the Pentagon is briefed by the CIA on the exile invasion and uh, General Gray of the Joint Staff tells the chiefs that only, US overt, only overt US military intervention can overthrow Castro, that the exile invasion alone cannot succeed. The Joint Chiefs know this. On January 22nd, Lemnitzer reveals to the new Secretary of State that Castro has an army of 32,000 men, a police force of 9,000 men, and a militia of 200,000 men. 
and had been receiving large amounts of supplies from the USSR, uh, which was making the exile invasion obviously seem more and more dubious. So President Kennedy's first big meeting on this subject is January 28th. And this is the one moment when the Joint Chiefs tell the President the truth. Dulles reports to the President at this meeting that the Pentagon's position was that no currently authorized course of action could succeed in overthrowing the Castro regime. And uh, of course this was true. And Lemnitzer confirmed this by saying that in spite of the CIA's optimistic view about the chances for the exiles to land and hold a beachhead, soon after they landed, Castro would bring in superior forces and the question would then be who would come to their aid? And as Newman puts it, the president did not bite. This told everyone in the room that the president was not interested in US military intervention in Cuba. So, just six days later, the Joint Chiefs flipped and submitted a formal evaluation of the paramilitary plan to invade Cuba and said, quote, in summary, evaluation of the current plan results in a favorable assessment. Uh, the report is full of uh, individual shortcomings, and yet, overall, they, they viewed it favorably. Quote, timely execution of this plan has a fair chance of ultimate success. Now, after the Bay of Pigs failed, and Maxwell Taylor came out of retirement to investigate what had happened for the president, it was determined that the chiefs really felt that the plan only had a 30% chance of success and a 70% chance of failure, and yet they said fair chance of success. By the way, after the site was changed from Trinidad to the Bay of Pigs, they then thought it was 2080, 20% 20 chance of success and 80% of failure. So on March 11th, President Kennedy disapproves Operation Pluto because he doesn't like the site at Trinidad. It's too noisy, it's too public. He's obsessed with plausible deniability, as was Eisenhower. And on March 15th, the Bay of Pigs is presented as the new site. Invade at the Bay of Pigs, invade the Playa Geron Peninsula. With approximately 1,500 men, a little bit less than 1,500. The Joint Chiefs of Staff approve this plan also. So on April 4th, President Kennedy approves the invasion and it's scheduled to begin on or about the 15th to the 17th of April. To his credit, he directs that the Cuban exile brigade leaders be informed that US military forces would not be allowed to participate in the invasion. He wanted those people told in any way that speaks well for the president. And John Newman pointed this out in his new book, and I did not know this until I read Countdown to Darkness. The president's continued insistence on plausible deniability causes Secretary of State Dean Rusk to gradually whittle down the size and number of airstrikes before the invasion. These are the Cuban exile airstrikes flying out of uh, Guatemala. Uh, to whittle down the size and number of airstrikes, but no one at any of the planning meetings informs the president about how essential they consider the planned airstrikes are to success. We all know the Bay of Pigs was the perfect failure. President Kennedy resisted repeated requests by the CIA and the Pentagon to save the invasion with US military intervention. He had told them privately before the invasion that there would be no US military intervention and he had also stated so publicly. When Castro started screaming about what was about to happen, uh, President Kennedy went on television and said there will be no US military involved in invading Cuba. So he decided to keep his promise about that and not be a liar and to take one on the chin and to deal with Castro later. He also was not in favor of uh, trying to save a hopeless and doomed exile invasion with ill-advised, ad hoc, incremental, and piecemeal US military actions. And he also knew he'd been set up. As David Talbot put it in his book, The Devil's Chessboard, the Bay of Pigs was, quote, 
not simply, simply doomed to fail, it was meant to fail, end quote. Meant to fail to suck the president in and get him to commit U.S. military forces. Now, John Newman has uh, published many eloquent comments about the Bay of Pigs in his new book, Countdown to Darkness. I'm just going to read the last one. Quote, President Kennedy had made it clear to his subordinates that he would not, under any circumstances, commit U.S. military forces to action in Cuba. Yet Dulles and the chiefs did not believe their commander-in-chief. They were certain that once the exile brigade was pinned down and being slaughtered on the beachhead, Kennedy would have to give in. The chiefs had lied about their professional position on the CIA plan. It was a disgraceful, disloyal, and insubordinate performance, end quote. So once Maxwell Taylor completed his review of the debacle, President Kennedy motored over to the Pentagon on May 27th and scolded the chiefs of staff to their faces. Uh, that cannot have been a pleasant meeting for anyone. He told them how dissatisfied he had been with their recent advice on Cuba and Laos, which were characterized by poor staff work and narrow-minded, blinded recommendations that failed to consider international or global strategic considerations. And then this meeting in person was followed on June 28th by three uh, national security action memos, which many of you have heard of, 55, 56, and 57. 55 was a personal scolding directly to the joint, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Lemnitzer. Uh, I expect the Joint Chiefs of Staff to present the military viewpoint and governmental councils in such a way as to assure that the military factors are clearly understood before decisions are reached. I regard the chiefs to be more than military men and expect their help in fitting military requirements into the overall context of any situation. Uh, the third INSAM issue that day, 57, said that the CIA can no longer conduct paramilitary, paramilitary operations unless they're small in size and within their scope and can remain wholly disavowable and wholly covert, and that any large paramilitary operations in the future would be the responsibility of the Pentagon. So Mongos is approved on November 30th, 1961. It's political, psychological, economic, and covert actions uh, designed to bring down the Castro regime while conti simultaneously continuing JCS planning for decisive U.S. capability for intervention. It's a two-tier uh, committee. The special group augmented of the National Security Council includes the heavy hitters, Robert Kennedy, Maxwell Taylor. Now, Maxwell Taylor is not chairman of the JCS yet. He's still President Kennedy's personal military advisor. Lyman Lemnitzer, he's chairman of the JCS. John McCone. U. Alexis Johnson and Roswell Gilpatrick, who's deputy SecDef. The weekly meetings uh, were attended by uh, two notable people in American Cuban history, William Harvey, the father of the Executive Action Assassination Program, and General Lansdale, the operations officer. Lansdale is the glue that holds mongers together. and. This is what we're going to be discussing in the next several slides. An obsession with invading Cuba using American armed forces grips the Pentagon in the spring of 1962. Here's the timeline. On January 17th, Lansdale requests that the Joint Staff prepare a policy statement on Cuba. They responded on February 7th. We'll, we'll look at that statement in just a moment. Lansdale on March the 5th, requested that General Craig of the Joint Staff provide a brief but, precise, brief but precise description of pretexts which would provide justification for U.S. military intervention in Cuba. And he wants the answer by March 13th. On March 13th, these pretexts uh, were signed out by JCS Chairman Lemnitzer and sent to Secretary of Defense McNamara, 
and uh, we'll review these in just a moment in detail. On the 16th, the idea of invading Cuba with U.S. military was rejected by the president, and the idea of the use of pretext was rejected by the president in a meeting, which we'll be discussing. On April 10th, the chiefs fought back and sent this blistering memo to McNamara, demanding that Cuba be invaded and that it be done in the near future. There was no mention of pretext anymore, and that advice was not followed. Now, I'm very proud to be able to say that it was the review board that got the Northwoods file of these pretexts shaken loose from the Pentagon. The Joint Staff Secretariat faithfully complied with our search requests and handed this over to me in 1997, and the military records team got it declassified in record time, and we released the documents that year. If there had been no JFK Records Act, you would not know anything about Northwoods. And if there had been no JFK movie, if there had been no JFK movie by Oliver Stone, there would have been no JFK Records Act. Okay, let's not forget that. So this policy statement, produced in response to Lansdale's request, uh, provided a lot of information, but I want you to focus on the first two. The Soviets could establish land, sea, or air bases in Cuba, and specifically the second one, the nightmare scenario, the Soviets could provide Castro with a number of ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads. So for these reasons, the policy statement says the existence of, the, of a communist Cuba regime is incompatible with our requirements in the Western Hemisphere, and they're prepared to act. They list conditions necessary to support a successful U.S. military intervention in Cuba. Uh, the first three are supposed to go together. There has to appear to be an, an urgent humanitarian requirement to restore order. Uh, the United States and, and or the OAS uh, have to announce that we're moving into Cuba to restore order and hold free elections. And this should be, happen so quickly that the communist bloc uh, doesn't have time to react elsewhere in the world. Or, and this big or is the telegraph. They had already figured out what they wanted to do. By the time these guys answered Lansdale's request, this is what they wanted to do. Or if the Cuban regime commits hostile acts against U.S. forces or property, which would serve as an incident upon which to base overt U.S. intervention. So that or is the condition necessary to support a U.S. invasion. So as I said, Lansdale requested pretexts on March the 5th. Uh, the Joint Chiefs considered this request two days later and provided a green light. And just two days later, after, a, after that, on March the 9th, uh, the Joint Staff came up with a pretext. I think they were sitting on go when they got the request. So this is the green light that the Joint Chiefs gave to the study. If you look at the second one, it says in red, determination that a creditable internal revolt is impossible of attainment, sick, <laughs> during the next nine to 10 months will require a decision by the United States to develop a Cuban provocation as justification for positive U.S. military action. So this is the green light given by the Joint Chiefs to the Joint Staff to come up with these pretexts. The, the pretexts were generated on March 9th by the Joint Staff and on on March 13th, just a few days later, they were approved in full without any changes by the chiefs and signed out by Lyman Lemnitzer and sent to McNamara. They included the following pretext for war. So all of these were false incidents in Guantanamo Bay Naval Base, which they were proposing. Fake an attack on the base, blow up ammunition on the base, blame it on Castro, sabotage a ship in the harbor with fires, sink a ship near the harbor entrance, a remember the main incident, they used that language, and conduct mock funerals afterwards. This one's very disturbing, the next one. Develop and implement a communist Cuban terror campaign in the United States, in Miami and other Florida cities, even in Washington, D.C., in which the targets could be anti-Castro Cuban refugees seeking haven in the United States. The exploding of real bombs could be engineered and attempts on the lives of Cuban refugees could be staged. 
even to include wounding. And false documents would be released to prove that Castro did it all. This is a really stupid one. A US jet such as an F-86, that's a Korean War fighter plane, short, stubby fighter plane, could be painted like a Cuban MiG and simulate an air attack on a US airliner. That one falls apart as soon as somebody takes a picture out the window and develops the picture and they notice, oh, that's not a MiG, that's an F-86. This is the scary one. It's a lot of words, I'll just tell you about it. The idea was to take a CIA-owned airliner, owned by a CIA charter company, turn it into a drone, remotely piloted, which could be blown up over Cuba. And uh, it would take off from Eglin Air Force Base uh, at the right time, be blown up over Cuba after tape recordings were played from the airplane's radio. We're being attacked, we're being attacked, help us, and then it would blow up. The right time would be after another airplane painted exactly the same would take off with fake passengers on board. Real people pretending to be passengers, th these would be covert operatives. Land secretly at Eglin Air Force Base, deplane the passengers, then the drone would take off and go get blown up over Cuba. Nobody's ever explained to me how this story is going to stand up when there are no bodies found. Think about that. There probably would have been an international investigation. There would have been no bodies, but th these people were serious about this. And the last one we'll talk about, a submarine, a U.S. submarine would deposit parts from a destroyed, in quotes, a destroyed U.S. fighter plane and claim it was shot down by the Cubans. And this would involve a, a pilot leaving formation without the other pilots knowing what was happening. He would leave the formation, claim he was being shot down, he would disappear and go back to his normal job. <laughs> I'm going to leave you with one thought. After World War II, we prosecuted people at Nuremberg for a conspiracy to make aggressive war. That's what this is, a conspiracy to make war. And there's only one reason it wasn't done, and that's John F. Kennedy, who, reject, who rejected the idea of the use of pretext on March 16, 62. I'm not going to read all of these points to you. You can read these later online. It was brought up at, at a meeting by Lemnitzer. Kennedy rejected the idea of pretexts and also rejected the idea of invading with U.S. forces, even if there were a popular revolt in Cuba. He says, we're not going to invade Cuba. End of subject. Lansdale took the minutes, and they weren't declassified until March 28, 2005. So I'm really happy that uh, David Talbot put all that in his book, his book Brothers. I've mentioned that the Joint Chiefs fought back and wrote a strong April memo to McNamara saying we need to invade Cuba now. And they think it can be done without risk of general war. That's the euphemism for worldwide nuclear conflict. <laughs> they think it can be done without the risk of general war. They do state continued police action would be required. That's an understatement. Uh, and they want it done as soon as possible, before the reserves go home. It didn't happen. So why did the Soviet Union put, oh boy, I better speed up. Why did the Soviet Union put missiles in Cuba? They were very aware of their strategic nuclear inferiority and uh, they wanted to defend their socialist communist ally and uh, they had misjudged President Kennedy as a weak leader based on Bay of Pigs and the Vienna summit. And they thought he could be rolled. So during the crisis, I'm sure you all know that the consensus position of the Joint Chiefs and the CIA was in support of bombing and invading Cuba to remove the medium-range ballistic missiles. However, JFK chose blockade in concert with the threat of airstrikes and invasion and strong diplomatic pressure. The hardliners, the Pentagon and the CIA, were of the opinion that the president could no longer refuse to take direct military action. 
and that the U.S. no longer needed any pretext for invasion, since a bona fide reason, indeed an imperative, had presented itself. After the crisis was resolved through diplomacy, President Kennedy met with the chiefs to thank them for their advice. There had been considerable friction with them during the crisis. And he said, gentlemen, we've won. You know we've won, I know we've won, but I don't want anybody, anyone to gloat about it. The responses were, George Anderson, Chief of Naval Operations, we've been had. LeMay exploded. One hell, we lost. It's the greatest defeat in our history. We should go in and wipe them out today, end quote. And of course, the tapes reveal that during the crisis, directly to President Kennedy on October 19th, LeMay said, this is almost as bad as the appeasement at Munich, and you're in a pretty bad fix. So throughout 1963, uh, two things are going on. The government's trying to come up with a new Cuba policy, because Mongoose was a dead program at this point. It was dead. Uh, and while the government is holding interdepartmental meetings, Maxwell Taylor is planning to invade using pretext, and he's planning to invade in 1964. Let me see if I can speed this up. These are Taylor's own words when he commissioned this study of the invasion plan for 64. Quote, consideration should be given to the advantages of engineering an incident as a cause for invasion. End quote. Because he knows there's not going to be a spontaneous revolt in Cuba. They send his own assumptions back to him as a policy statement, the Joint Staff, very loyal. And, uh, at the bottom of this slide, you'll see the conclusion section states, U.S. should create a pretext for overt U.S. military intervention in Cuba and launch military action to remove the Castro government. This is amazing to me. Kennedy rejected pretext on March 16, 62, and decided not to invade even during the missile crisis, and then issued a no invasion pledge in November 62. What is Maxwell Taylor up to? Now, the invasion plan for 64, which uh, Sinclair came up with, uh, included many steps. I'm going to just read you three of the milestones. The State Department's job is to come up with a free Cuban government. That's what they were supposed to do before the Bay of Pigs, too. They're supposed to insert them about July 15th, 64, about the time they begin to mobilize the US military for the invasion. Listen to this, folks. On Cuban Independence Day, that's the equivalent of our July the 4th, a surprise airstrike would be launched against Cuba by the United States. The invasion would take place about August 3rd, and the assumption was that uh, by October 1st, note that's a month before the election in 64, it would all be over. Uh, this was mysteriously withdrawn from consideration on October 4th, 63. We don't specifically know why. Uh, planning to launch a devastating surprise air attack on the Cuban Independence Day was unbelievably tone deaf, to say the least. Uh, we don't know why Taylor is doing this. Presumably, he's acting on his own. This is one of the slides I'll encourage you to read later when this, is, this presentation is online. The, ICCCA was the Interdepartmental Coordinating Committee on Cuban Affairs. It's too hard to say that, so we call it IEEE. This ad hoc committee met all year long, and it was basically state, CIA, and Pentagon. Those were the main agencies involved. The state precondition and the Kennedy's precondition in setting their charter was that invasion by the U.S. would not be undertaken in the absence of aggression that threatens the peace and security of the Western Hemisphere. So they were not to start with the assumption that the U.S. would invade. But what will our policy be? The policy was still to be to remove Castro, okay? The hawks on the committee, or hawks studying the work of the committee, people like Paul Nitze, Elmo Zumwalt, and the Joint Chiefs themselves eventually hijacked this committee 
and came up with a resolution that did indeed authorize massive U.S. military intervention as the U.S. policy, as the new U.S. policy, if it was preceded by a U.S. instigated coup in Cuba, which would give the military action legitimacy. So the final draft of this plan, uh, which was sent back to Taylor by Cyrus Vance on October 30th, started out sounding very uh, high-minded and uh, everything that the president had initially wanted. Quote, the U.S. does not contemplate either a premeditated full-scale invasion of Cuba, except in the case of Soviet intervention or the reintroduction of nuclear weapons, or the contrivance of a provocation, which could be used as a pretext for such action. That sounds great. That's what President Kennedy wanted them to take as their uh, founding guidelines. But as you read the draft, as you continue to read it, it turns out that that was just window dressing. Because the whole plan, and I encourage you to read this later online, the whole plan was to uh, insert a new government into Cuba, selected by us, of course, insert a special team along with them, which within one day, 24 hours, that's a joke, would make a decision on whether or not Cuba was ready for the invasion. In other words, would the new government we inserted be able to instigate a coup? Would they be able to take over the government? And if they were able to do so, uh, the coup leaders would publicly proclaim a provisional government and openly request U.S. and OAS assistance. The president would then announce isolation of Cuba by air and sea blockade. And then we would invade using the same op plans that we were going to use during the missile crisis. Presumably, uh, this coup in Cuba, which was what they called this plan, would have, been, would have involved an assassination, presumably. So this staged or engineered coup, probably engineered by CSA, CIA assassination and uh, the immediate insertion of a new Cuban government was nothing more, in my view, than a pretext. So this idea would not go away. Extreme bitterness and deep hatred for JFK over U.S. foreign policy direction existed within key elements of the national security state, the Pentagon and the CIA, following the end of the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is John Newman's language, and I couldn't think of a better way to say it, so I used his language, extreme bitterness and deep hatred for the president. I believe that widespread anger within the establishment over President Kennedy's desire not to invade Cuba prior to the missile crisis and his refusal to do so during the crisis was surely the proximate cause of his assassination. Now, other events during 63 surely uh, stiffened the resolve of the coup plotters. I'm talking about the U.S. coup plotters that removed President Kennedy to do what they were, wanted to do, asking the FBI to shut down the training camps for, for Cuban exiles, uh, the peace speech, the nuclear test ban treaty, and then his attempt for a rapprochement with Castro in September and October of 63. All of those things, I'm sure, and especially the decision to withdraw from Vietnam in October, which I know Jim will talk about later today, in SAM 263, those additional decisions, I think, only strengthened their resolve, but I assume the assassination plot was hatched right after the missile crisis. I believe that a coup took place in this country is undeniable. Uh, there's indisputable evidence of crossfire in Daly Plaza. The U.S. government did all it could to cover up the assassination, not to solve it. I'm talking about people inside the CIA and the FBI. That's what I'm talking about. President Kennedy's autopsy was a sham, intended to suppress all evidence of shots from the front and report only evidence of shots from the rear, consistent with the official cover story, which is that a man in a building shot a man in a car. I have to finish in two minutes, so let me just summarize why I say the autopsy is a sham. I wrote a five-volume book documenting this, over 1,800 pages, so please take my word for it. Okay, here's the, here are the summary points. 
of why I say the autopsy is a sham. The president's body arrived at Bethesda 20 minutes prior to the motorcade from Andrews Air Force Base in the wrong casket and in the wrong vehicle, proving a break in the chain of custody and thus invalidating the autopsy. That's a medical legal fact. That would have invalidated the autopsy if it had been known at the time. Numerous autopsy photographs and at least two skull x-rays are missing. The three surviving skull x-rays are forged composite copy films. They're altered films. Thanks to the work of David Mantic, we know this. The conduct of a second fraudulent brain exam followed the initial brain exam after the autopsy. Things like this just don't happen, folks. You're killed by gunshot wound to the brain, there's an autopsy on your body, your brain is preserved. The brain is examined once. It's cut up and examined and photographed. There were two brain exams following President Kennedy's autopsy. The photographs from the second exam of a substitute brain is what's in the National Archives today. It's not President Kennedy's brain that's imaged in those photographs. And it's not the pattern of damage that was really in his brain, okay? That's how you control an investigation and that's how you back, uh, buttress a false autopsy report. The JFK autopsy report in the archives today is only the third written version. The first two were destroyed, one by burning by Dr. Humes, the second one was kept by Robert Kennedy, never given to the archives. We don't know where it is today. It's probably at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean in the Dallas casket. Uh, I'm going to leave you with this closing thought. Right here. Well, the legend constructed around President Kennedy's accused assassin as a Castro sympathizer was clearly a determined attempt by those who designed the assassination plot to blame JFK's death on Fidel Castro. Was JFK's assassination, therefore, designed to serve as a Northwoods-style pretext for a U.S. invasion of Cuba? That's my big question that I leave you with to consider. The love of pretext was endemic in all Cuba planning throughout 62 and 63. Although President Kennedy's assassination did not trigger an invasion of Cuba, it may nevertheless have been intended to. And in the minds of the operational planners, the coup plotters who took down President Kennedy, it would have been the perfect revenge against a president they hated and despised, namely to ensure his death became the stimulus for the US military invasion of Cuba that he would never authorize. Thank you.